Welcome to this yet another session on our lecture series on head and neck anatomy, where we are looking at topographic anatomy of the neck. In this particular session, we are going to focus on the topographic anatomy of the neck triangles. Now, the neck triangles could be a bit extensive in their description. And so for the ease of delivery, I've chosen to divide this into three parts. This first part, which we're going to look at right now, will focus on the posterior neck triangles, but it will also focus on the general organization of the neck, and I'll be highlighting on those specific things. The second part of the lecture will focus on anterior neck triangles, and I'll divide that into two parts. So we have what we call the infrahyoid triangles and the suprahyoid triangles. Uh, let's specifically look at what we have for this particular session. Before we talk about the neck triangles themselves, maybe it's important to understand that the extent of the neck. The neck is considered to extend from above the lower border of the mandible, as well as uh, the base of the cranium there, the base of the skull there. So this is showing us the base of the skull around there, and this is showing us the inferior border of the mandible. So that's the superior extent of the neck. The inferior extent of the neck will include the level of the thoracic inlet, but will also include uh, the clavicle itself on the lateral aspect and some part of the scapula going all the way back to the vertebral column. Thoracic inlet is this junction between the neck and the thorax through which structures pass. Usually the thoracic inlet is be bounded by the maneuverum of the sternum anteriorly, the T1 vertebra posteriorly, and uh, the first rib uh, laterally. The skeleton of the neck consists of uh, a number of bones and cartilages. The cartilages are largely the ones of the larynx, so we just call them laryngeal cartilages, mm -hmm. and we'll talk more about them when you look at the larynx itself in detail. However, the bones of the neck are worth talking about. So we have the hide bone, which we'll be talking about in this particular lecture. Other than the hide bone, we also have the cervical spine. This is the vertebral column at the level of the spine, and we'll be talking more about that one. However, where as we discuss anatomy of the neck topographically, it's important also to familiarize with the anatomy of the base of skull because a number of things uh, connect the base of skull to the neck. And so we'll also talk about base of skull anatomy in this particular lecture. Um, the neck is very important for passage of a number of neurovascular structures. There's some neurovascular structures that leave the cranial cavity to enter into the neck or even pass through the neck to go to the thorax. There's some neurovascular structures that pass from the thorax going into the neck and even passing beyond the neck to go to the cranium. There's some that will connect the neck to the upper limbs as well. So the neck is a useful passage for these neurovascular structures. And some of them are very key to the extent that injury to them may be detrimental to life actually. Other than the neurovascular structures, we also know that some regions of the respiratory tree are found in the neck. In particular, we're talking about the larynx itself and the trachea, they are part of the neck. So they're in the cervical viscera. We also have the parts of the digestive system and in particular, the pharynx and the esophagus, they also traverse the neck very important components of the digestive system, also part of the cervical viscera. There are some endocrine glands, which are also in the neck in particular. We can talk about the thyroid gland as well as the parathyroid glands, which are attached to them. For the sake of description, the topographic anatomy of the neck is divided into triangles. And these triangles are the ones you're going to focus on in this particular lecture. Um, based on fascial arrangement and organization, there are some potential spaces between the fascial layers. And so we call this on the neck spaces. Again, in this particular lecture, we'll be focusing on the neck spaces, although 
these next spaces will be more emphasis will be when we talk about the suprahyde and the infrahyde neck triangles. That's when we'll highlight also on the next spaces in great detail. So what is the lecture outline of this presentation? We will first look at the relevant osteology, focusing on hide bone, cranial base, and cervical spine anatomy. Then we will look at the junction, the joint between the cranium and the cervical spine. This is the craniovertebral junction. We look at the joints which constitute the craniovertebral junction. There are two major joints, atlanto-occipital joint and uh, atlanto-axial articulation. We'll look at those two in great detail. And then we'll focus on the superficial structures which are found in the neck. There's, there's a muscle, there's some nerves, and there's some veins. We'll focus on them. We look at how the deep fascia of the neck is organized into different components, and we'll just mention how they run. We may not talk much about the attachments. And then uh, we'll now focus on how the neck, and especially the anterior and lateral neck, is divided into neck triangles, the anterior and the posterior triangles, and even the subdivisions of these triangles. After we've done that, then we'll now focus on the posterior neck triangles. And there are two posterior neck triangles, the occipital triangle and the supraclavicular triangle. We'll check the boundaries, the contents, and the clinical relevance of these triangles. As we look at the contents, we'll describe the anatomy of some of these major contents. Last but not least, we will talk about a triangle that is much behind in the neck called the suboccipital triangle. It may not be considered part of these general triangles that we've talked about, but that's also an important area that I'll want to highlight on as we discuss the posterior neck triangles. So let's start with the relevant osteology and uh, we'll begin with the hyoid bone. You may or may not have seen hyoid bone before. It's a U-shaped bone, very small, usually on forming part of the laryngoskeleton. Laryngoskeleton has bones, cartilages, and some connective tissue membranes and ligaments. So hyoid bone is one of those things that constitute the laryngeal skeleton. So you find it somewhere there in the neck. Usually, if you want to know the location of the hide bone, you trace uh, from with your finger from the angle of the 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 genu of the mandible. There, you go posteriorly, and especially at that corner where the flow of the mouth meet with the neck there, or meet with the vertical component of the neck, that is the region where you'll find the hide bone. This is how the bone looks like. Generally, this bone is not attached to another bone. It doesn't quite directly articulate with other osseous structures. It is suspended from the tip of the solid processes by the stylohyde ligament and the stylohyoid muscle. So these are paired structures, remember, so right and left part. Embryologically, the hide bone arises from two pharyngeal arches. The upper part of the hide bone, which constitute uh, perhaps that region there, and uh, these small projections, which we call the lesser horn, those ones arise from the second pharyngeal arc. Then this lower part of the body and uh, these longer projections, which we call the greater horns, arise from the third pharyngeal arc. So we've already said there for the parts of the hide bone. The hide bone has a body and two pairs of horns. The lesser horns, which are above and short, and the greater horns, which are inferior and more posterior and more projecting. So these are the horns of the hide bone. The lesser horn and upper part of the body from the second pharyngeal arc, the lower part of the body and the greater horn from the third pharyngeal arc. The primary role of hide bone is largely for muscle attachment. So there are a number of muscles that are attached to the hide. And we can use this even to talk about 
suprahyoid muscles and infrahyoid muscles based on which muscles attach on the upper part or on the upper part and which muscle on the lower part of the hyoid. Other than for muscle attachment, and these muscles generally are uh, adjusting the position of the larynx generally. Some of them are called extrinsic muscles of the larynx because of what they do, but we'll talk more about that when you look at the anterior triangles. And then for muscle attachment, consider that the bone, it definitely offers some protection and structural uh, support to the larynx as well as the pharynx. From a medical legal point of view, this bone is a very delicate one. Um, commonly, if somebody has been strangulated perhaps to death, uh, the hard bone is one of those bones that will be easily fractured because of that trauma. And so this bone is usually examined, especially in one to uh, determine a cause of death that is mysterious. Uh, you may want to check if the hide bone is intact or fractured, and that can give you a clue as to the kind of trauma that uh, the deceased went through. That is hide bone. Let's talk about now the anatomy of the cranial base. I hope you do remember that the cranium is the bone of the skull. We use the term cranium when we don't include the mandible into the picture. So base of skull or base of the cranium extend from anteriorly this dentition of the maxilla. So, and especially the incisor teeth there. So the maxillary incisor teeth to posteriorly the posterior nuchal lines, which are present on the occipital bone. When we look at the base of the skull, we can notice quite a number of foramina, and we've talked about this foramina in the previous lecture, especially the one on the skull. And so I don't want to really repeat them, but it's important to remind yourself about this foramina, especially when you discuss the neck, because now things should now be adding into that information. Structures we are going to talk about in the neck, a number of them will be passing through this foramina. And so you should remember what the foramina have. That is the foramen magnum, that the jugular foramen, we have the carotid canal there, foramen spinosum. We have the foramen valley there, that is lacerum. Remember lacerum is usually covered by cartilage in the living uh, and many other foramina that you may see in this particular view. We can divide the skull base into four regions for the sake of description. We have the anterior part of the skull base, which is largely made up of the hard palate and maxillary dentition. So this is the anterior part of the skull base or the cranial base. Remember that uh, the hard palate consists of the horizontal plates of the maxillary bone and the palatine bone largely. So this is the palatine bone, and these are the horizontal plates of the maxillary bone, what we call the palatine processes of the maxillary bone. The middle part is around this region, and this is basically the level where the sphenoid body is resting. So this is the sphenoid bone around this region, the pterygoid plates you're seeing, medial and lateral pterygoid plates, these are actually part of the sphenoid bone, basically. Other than the sphenoid base, we also have the basilar part of the occipital bone, which is this one. And so the basilar part of the occipital bone articulate with the sphenoid body there. Uh, remember that uh, there's actually an important joint there between the basilar part of occipital and the sphenoid bone and the two usually unite to form what we call the clivus. The apices of the petrous bone are also found in the middle of the cranial base. This is the petrous bone, uh, right and left one, we see them there. So these are the apices. We can see that their apices are also in the middle of the cranial base. 
we do have the lateral part of the cranial base, and the lateral part of the cranial base is largely this region, consisting of the zygomatic arches. Remember, zygomatic arch is formed by the temporal process of the zygomatic bone and the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. So this forms the zygomatic arch. Other than the zygomatic arch, you have this region, the mandibular fossa. This is the region that constitutes the temporal mandibular joints. We have the tympanic plate, which forms part of the external auditory meatus there. You have the cellular process there, which are sharp projections of the temporal bone inferiorly, and you have the mastoid bone here. So this is the lateral part of the skull base or the lateral part of the cranial base. Lastly, we have the posterior part of the cranial base. The posterior part of the cranial base is largely formed by the occipital bone itself, and especially the larger part of the squamous occipital bone. We can notice that uh, around the foramen magnum, we have the condyles of the occipital bone. These are the ones that articulate with the atlas, and we are going to talk about that shortly when you look at craniovertebral articulations. Now let's talk about the cervical spine. I commonly prefer on the C-spine, uh, but we can just call the cervical spine. So this is the lateral view of the cervical spine. Um, the cervical spine displays a secondary curvature, as you can see, this is the anterior part and this is the posterior part. Remember that secondary curvature is the lodotic curvature, so we call this the cervical lodosis, which is normal. Remember, lodotic curvature of the C-spine develops as an adaptation for supporting the neck, an adaptation for uh, supporting the head on the neck. And so this is largely developing within the first few months after birth. The C-spine has seven, a total of seven cervical vertebra. This is C1, which we call the atlas. This is C2, which we call the axis. This is C3, this is C4, that is C5, this is C6. And this is C7, which you call vertebra prominence. So a total of seven cervical vertebra. We also have a total of five intervertebral discs. Uh, so understand that uh, the articulation between the occipital bone and the atlas doesn't have an intervertebral disc. Also, the articulation between the C1 and C2 do not have the intervertebral disc. The others, therefore, have the disc, and that's what makes them five. There are a number of ligaments that also connect the C-spine, and this is not just unique to C-spine. These ligaments are generally intervertebral ligaments, but there are specific ones which I'll talk about. So the anterior longitudinal ligament is expected in this region, joining the anterior vertebral body of the adjacent vertebra. Posterior longitudinal ligaments, uh, join the posterior aspects of the vertebral bodies. So if this is the anterior longitudinal ligaments in front of the vertebral bodies, posterior longitudinal ligament will be here behind the vertebral bodies inside the vertebral canal. That posterior longitudinal ligament will have a unique name when we go up there we'll call it membrana tentoria, but we'll talk about that shortly. The, the laminae of the vertebra are joined also by interlaminar ligaments. The spinous processes are joined by interspinous ligaments. The tip of spine to tip of spine are joined by the supraspinous ligaments, but remember, supraspinous ligaments at the level of the neck constitute the ligamentum nuclei. We can describe the cervical vertebra as having two types of vertebra. We have the typical vertebrae and the atypical vertebra. A typical cervical vertebra has the following features. So in this superior view, this is a typical cervical vertebra. It will have that structure labeled seven, a hole through the transverse foramen, 
which we call foramen transversarium or the transvas foramen. This transvas foramen is for passage of the vertebral artery, the artery that supplies the brain, one of the artery that supply the brain. It passes through this foramina as it goes to the brain. And we'll be talking more about it in this particular lecture. Anyway, before we move from, away from that, so it should make sense to you that only cervical vertebra should have the foramen transversarium typically because the brain is on the upper part. You don't expect thoracic and lumbar vertebra to be having this foramen in the understanding that the artery that gives rise to the vertebral artery is just at the level of the upper thorax or lower neck. Typical cervical vertebra also has a split spinous process. You can see this one split into two, and that's what we call the bifid spine. Usually the spinous process is not very long. It's not very long compared to thoracic and lumbar, but importantly, it is bifid. So this bifid spinous process is also typical of this vertebra. When you look at the shape of the vertebral canal, or what we call neural canal, it's largely triangular or almost triangular, so to speak. That may not be very typical of it. Uh, like it doesn't have to be a very strong distinguishing feature because we expect a lot of transitions to happen. But it's one of the things you can actually use to pick it out easily. The typical cervical vertebra also has what we call the unseen processes. The antenate processes are lateral projections, the lateral upward projections of the vertebral body. So in this region, we'll expect it here and there. And on this view, this one labeled one is the antenate process. These antenate processes are lateral upward projections of the vertebral body. And because of these lateral upward projections, they tend to then form an articulation with the lateral aspects of the vertebral body of the vertebra above. And those, so those articulations they make are the ones we call ankovertebral joints or neurocentral joints or the joints of Lushka. Very unique to cervical vertebra. We don't have them in the other vertebra. Uh, maybe in this view, you'll see that better. So if this is a vertebra, that's another vertebra. These are the unseen processes. So this is the unseen process of this vertebra. And so this, this articulation here between the unseen process of the vertebra below and the inferior as inferior lateral aspect of the vertebra above making an articulation there. It's been believed that uh, these articulations are largely uh, synovial, but perhaps uh, they're also largely because of degenerative changes. Now, let's remind ourselves about the parts of a typical vertebra. So this is the spinous process. This is the lamina. And that's the pedicle. This is the transverse process. This is the superior articulating facet. A similar one on the lower part will be called the inferior articulating facet. And perhaps in this view, we see the inferior articulating facet there and the superior articulating facet there. This is the vertebral body, and we've already talked about the antenna processes. If you talk about the ligaments, so you'll expect the anterior longitudinal ligament to run here, the posterior longitudinal ligament to run here, the interlaminar ligament to join the lamina and lamina. Usually, they're more inside than outside. So the interlaminar ligaments will be here. The interspinous ligaments will be here and supraspinous ligaments, which in this region, therefore, will form part of the nuchal ligament, will be at the tip of spine to tip of spine. We have already looked at that. So this is C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, and C7. How about the atypical cervical vertebrae? The atypical cervical vertebrae are the C1 vertebra, C2 vertebra, and the C7 vertebra. 
that means uh, that uh, the typical cervical vertebra will be C2, sorry, C3 up to C6. Maybe this image will help us to consolidate that information. The first image we're seeing there is of a typical cervical vertebra. And this largely encompass C3 up to C6. Then the second one there is the C1 vertebra, which is atypical. This is Atlas. Now I want to look at Atlas and ask ourselves, what is making Atlas be atypical? What is unique about the Atlas compared to the first image there? We can highlight some things. First, the Atlas doesn't seem to have a body. Instead, it has an anterior arc and a posterior arc. So there's no body, but it has an anterior arc and a posterior arc. Second unique thing about the atlas is the size of the neural canal, quite big compared to the other one. And of course, here we can talk about it being triangular as well. And it has a very wide uh, neural canal. This neural canal will definitely accommodate the spinal cord and something else. It will accommodate the dense or the odontal process of the axis, which is C2. Look at the spinous process of Atlas. You almost don't even have the spinous process. We just call it a tubercle. So this posterior tubercle is usually quite short, as you can see, and not necessarily by feed as well. In terms of the this region, so these are the ones we call the lateral masses. The lateral masses of the atlas will have the articulating facets. So this is the superior articulating facet. And there'll be a similar one on the lower part, which receives the axis. This upper part receives the condyle of the occipital. C2 vertebrae is also unique in its view, as you can see. And the most unique thing about C2 vertebra, which is the axis, is the presence of this upward projection which we call the odontal process or the dense. This odontal process is the one that functions as the body of an atlas basically, uh, but it is part of the axis. It also has lateral masses. The lateral masses are the ones that receive the articulating facets, the inferior articulating facets of the atlas. Last but not least, we have the C7 vertebra. And what's unique about the C7 vertebra is this projection of the spinous process posteriorly, a bit unique compared to the others. It, the, the spinous process is a bit long. We call this in the vertebra prominence. So that's why this, this vertebra is called the vertebra prominence. Well, the other unique thing about uh, C7 vertebra that usually it may lack the transverse process sorry, the foramen in the transverse process, the one level three, that may lack that one. Most of them do not have the foramen transversarium because in about 90% of cases, the vertebral artery enters from C6 upwards. It will not enter through C7. Occasionally it may, and that's why this particular bone has it because perhaps in this particular situation, the vertebral artery was passing through C7 as well. Great, so we are now looking at some images here. These are lateral views of uh, the cervical spine, and uh, it's been just nice to be able to know a few things. Uh, let's look at the second image there. I'll play a video. You'll just be knowing some things. So this is the anterior tubercle of the atlas. That's the posterior arc of the atlas itself. Remember that uh, atlas doesn't have a body, but has those arches. Then this is the posterior tubercle of the atlas. Remember that uh, it, the spine is not bifid. This is the axis with the body as well as the odontal process. The pass in intertranquilis is the region between the upper and the lower articulating facets of the vertebra. That's a lamina, and there's nothing unique about that. It's This is the region of the lamina of the vertebrae now. And this is just an example of how the facet joint looks like. So 
This is the one between C3 and C4, but all those are facet join. There's a vertebral body representing how they look like. This is how spinous process looks like. Uh, this is the region corresponding with the regions of articulations. And that hyperdense thing is basically the transverse process of the vertebra. And so you can pick them easily from all the others. We can now look at the last image there. What is important for you to understand in the last image is that the vertebra should be aligned under some lines that we can draw smoothly. Anterior to the vertebra, we have the anterior vertebral line should be smooth. Behind the vertebral bodies, the posterior vertebral line should also be smooth. And the one between the junction between the lamina and the spine, the spinal lamina line should also be smooth. And also the one joining the tips of spine should also be smooth. Importantly, also we have the soft tissue between the, the cervical spine and, or rather the soft tissues in front of the cervical spine before the airway, this uh, dark region represents the airway. So the soft tissue just on the upper part should be very thin. The normal one should be less than uh, seven millimeters in an adult, especially at the level of C2 there. And on the lower part, there, there are more soft tissues because remember here, we also expect now that uh, the esophagus is somewhere there. Uh, at this particular region, we expect that uh, the soft tissue thickness should not be greater than 22 millimeters at the level of C7. These are important measurements to take uh, when you evaluate some pathologies around the cervical spine. Okay, we are focusing on still the third image there. So that's the body of C7. We've already talked about that. All right, we've already talked about the four lines as well. You can see how smooth they should be. And so if you see any disruption between these lines, then you know that uh, perhaps there's some dislocation, especially in the context of trauma. This is an anteroposterior view of the cervical spine. And important to note, is uh, the orientation of the transverse processes of the cervical vertebra compared to the orientation of the transverse processes of the thoracic vertebra. So the one you're seeing here is the transverse process of the C7 vertebra, which is this one. And we can generally say that uh, it's facing laterally and inferiorly. And then the next one, the transverse process of T1 vertebra is facing laterally but superiorly. So the transverse processes of the thoracic vertebra face slightly upwards. And the transverse processes of the cervical vertebra face slightly downwards. That's how we then determine that this is C7 and that this is T1 vertebra. This is the spinous processes of the vertebra. So this is the spinous process of T1, of T2, and this is of uh, C7, C6, C5, going upwards like that. We can trace up here and we can see the odontal process there shown in this particular image. That's the odontal process. So this is the axis, basically. We can also trace a number of things. For example, you can see the ancinate processes there, that one, so that the ancinate process of what, the one of the vertebral, as you can see it projecting there, perhaps we can see more of the information in this particular image. Let me just make that play so that you can have a feel of a number of structures. All right, we can see the facet joint between adjacent vertebrae there. We can also see that uh, the articular pillar margin should be at least uh, uniform in a particular plane. 
that's body and laminar, nothing much about that. We've already talked about the unseen processes. And so we can also see the joint, the ankle vertebral joints. Um, we've already talked about how to pick what is a T and what is a C in this particular region based on the orientation of the transverse processes. And that's what's being shown there. So this is important, especially in one to also determine whether a particular rib is a cervical rib or a thoracic rib, you use that concept. We already talked about the C2 vertebra with its uh, odontal process going up there. Okay, so this is the anteroposterior view of the cervical spine. That marks the end of uh, our discussion on the relevant osteology. But to make the story complete, it is important to then talk about the vertebral, the craniovertebral articulations, the joints between the cranium and the cervical spine. So when you talk about the craniovertebral articulations or craniovertebral joints, we're talking about the joints between the base of skull and the upper cervical spine. Uh, these joints permit horizontal movements like these ones and vertical movements like this one. So they permit those movements. And these movements are important, especially if you understand the context of the visual field, they're important to manipulate your visual field. So they help the position of the head is well regulated with movements of the eye uh, to facilitate uh, manipulations of the visual field. These joints involve two or rather three major osseous elements. We have the condyles of the occipital, which are not shown in this particular image, but you've already seen them. The atlas, which is the C1 vertebra, which is that one. And the axis, which is the C2 vertebra, which is that one. Because of those three osseous elements, there are two types of joints that I will talk about here. The joint between the atlas and the occipital bone, that's what we call the atlanto-occipital joint. And the joints between the atlas and the axis, what we call the atlanto-axial joints. Let's begin with the atlanto-occipital joint. The atlanto-occipital joints are two joints, which means right and left, synovial joints. Between the superior articulating facet of the atlas, which is this one, and the occipital condyle. You notice that uh, the superior articulating facet of the atlas is on the upper part of the lateral mass of the atlas. This superior articulating facet of the atlas are concave in appearance and slightly inward facing. This particular joint is the one that largely allows flexion and extension movements of the head on the neck. In terms of the things that reinforce it, other than the fibrous capsule, because it's a synovial joint, so there's this synovial joint on this side and synovial joint on that side. Other than those synovial joints and the fibrous capsule that uh, reinforce them or cover them, we also have some membranes in form of uh, connective tissue ligaments that also reinforce the atlanto-occipital joint. In particular, there's a membrane that runs in front here of the anterior arc to the anterior margin of the occipital bone. Sorry, the anterior margin of the foramen magnum. We call that the anterior atlanto-occipital membrane. We also have a membrane that joins the posterior arc of atlas the posterior margin of the foramen magnum, we call that the posterior atlanto-occipital membrane. So these are just fibrous membranes and they blend with the fibrous capsule of the joints. We can see here, this is the anterior atlanto-occipital membrane, which connect the anterior arc of atlas to the anterior margin of the foramen magnum on the occipital bone. Similarly, this is the posterior Atlanto-occipital membrane that connect the posterior arc of atlas to the posterior margin of the foramen magnum in the occipital bone. So that is atlanto-occipital joint. Then we have another 
complex joint, the atlantoaxial joints. The atlantoaxial joints are also synovial joints, but now between the atlas and the axis. These ones involve three joints instead of two. So what are the three joints? We have the paired joints between the lateral masses of the involved bones. So the lateral mass of the atlas and the lateral mass of axis articulate, in which case the inferior articulating facet of the atlas articulate the superior articulating facet of the axis at that joint and also at that joint. So those ones are paired, right and left. Those are the lateral joints. But there's also a median joint, which is a bit complex. This median joint is a joint between the dense of the axis and the anterior arc of the atlas at that particular space there. But it doesn't include that, that one only. There's also another ligament, which we call the transverse ligament of the atlas, which passes from here that way and that way. That ligament also has a synovial articulation with the posterior aspect of the dance. So there's a ligament component of it that also hold the dance posteriorly, but it has a synovial articulation with the posterior aspect of the dance. Then the anterior aspect of the dense articulate with the posterior surface of the anterior arc of atlas at that point. That joint is relatively complex with the number of ligaments, and we're going to see that shortly. The atlantoaxial joint generally allows rotational movements, and this is an example of a rotational movement of the head on the neck. This joint is reinforced by a number of ligaments. One, we have the anterior longitudinal ligament. So the anterior longitudinal ligament is just part of the extension of the anterior longitudinal ligament that we know, joining the anterior part of the body of uh, axis now to the anterior tubercle of the atlas. That ligament blends with the anterior atlanto-occipital membrane. This image shows you the anterior longitudinal ligament. So it helps to reinforce the articulation between axis and the atlas. Other than the anterior longitudinal ligament, we also have the interlaminar ligament or otherwise known as ligamentum flavum. Ligamentum flavum join the lamina of the axis and the posterior arc of atlas. And so this is the ligamentum flavum. It's the extension of the ligamentum flavum that we know joining the lamina of axis, the posterior arc of atlas. This ligament also blends with the fibrous capsule of the joints of the lateral masses of the two involved bones. Maybe this image will help us to understand or put into perspective a number of joints, a number of ligaments between the atlas, the axis, and the occipital bone. Let's start with the ones we've already talked about regarding the joint between atlas and the occipital bone, the atlanto-occipital joint. So we can see the anterior atlanto-occipital membrane there from the anterior arc of atlas to the anterior border of the foramen magnum. We can also see the posterior atlanto-occipital membrane there from the posterior arc of atlas to the posterior border of the foramen magnum. So these are the anterior and posterior atlanto-occipital membranes. In addition to those membranes, which reinforce the atlanto-occipital joint, we've also talked about the anterior longitudinal ligament, which is this one, joining the anterior vertebral bodies. Now, superiorly, we can see that it joins there and also join the anterior arc of atlas there. So this anterior longitudinal ligament reinforces the atlantoaxial joint, as we can see there. Okay, we've mentioned that one. The other ligament I want us to mention is this one. You can see the posterior longitudinal ligament there. Follow it upwards and you'll see something. So when the posterior longitudinal ligament goes beyond this level or at this level, 
it spans a bit broader and then attached onto the anterior border of the foramen magnum. This expanded part of the posterior longitudinal ligament is what we call the tentorial ligament, tectorial ligament. The tectorial ligament or ligamental tectoria is a broadening of the posterior longitudinal ligament as it traverses the craniovertebral junction. Deep to that is something unique and uh, we'll need a better view for that. So I want you to see that there's actually a synovial articulation between the anterior arc of atlas and the dense there. But there's also another synovial articulation here between the posterior aspect of the dense and a ligament here. So this ligament here is what we call the cruciate ligament. Don't confuse this cruciate ligament with this one, the apical ligament of the dense. The apical ligament of the dense attaches the tip of the dense, which is C2, to the occipital bone. So it's a ligament that reinforces C2 to the occipital bone. But of course, in so doing, it also reinforces the craniovertebral articulation. There are also other ligaments, which you call the ala ligaments, which connect the lateral surfaces of the dents to the occipital bone again. Uh, we'll see them in another view. But I want us to talk about this cruciate ligament. So this is what we call the transverse ligament of the atlas or the transverse atlantal ligament. The transverse atlantal ligament is a ligament that crosses on the posterior aspect of the dents and so holding the dents in place. It attaches from the atlas and then goes behind the dents and then attach to atlas again. This image shows you the transverse atlantal ligament. It's a thick band. This thick band makes a synovial articulation with the posterior surface of the dents, as I've already mentioned. Around its center, there are some fibers that connect this transverse ligament on the upper part and on the lower part. We call this one the longitudinal component. So there's a longitudinal component on the superior aspect and a longitudinal component on the inferior aspect. If we add that information to the transverse atlantal ligament, then we see that this ligament is in the form of a cross, and that is why it's called the cruciform ligament. So the cruciform ligament has transverse portion, which is the thick and the main portion, and vertical portions, which are weak. That is the, the cruciform ligament of this particular junction. Other than that, we also have ligaments that connect the axis to the occipital bone, and uh, we've mentioned some. Uh, in particular, I've talked about membrana tecto uh, tectoria, which is the broadening of the posterior longitudinal ligament as it passes through here, and that's the most posterior ligament. We also have the apical ligament and the ala ligaments of the dens. Now, this is the apical ligament of the dens. It attaches the tip of the dents to the occipital bone. Then the ala ligaments of the dents attach the lateral aspect to the base of the dents, again, to the occipital bone. Don't confuse the ala ligaments with the, with the cruciform ligaments. Cruciform ligaments are on the posterior aspects of the dents, and they don't quite articulate, they don't quite attach with the dents. They just articulate, so the dents slide on them. But these ones we are talking about now attached, they hold the dense to the occipital bone. Of course, in so doing, uh, they'll reinforce the craniovertebral articulation. This one shows you the membrana tectoria, the broadening of the posterior longitudinal ligaments. Usually it's described to have two components, the superficial and the deep component. The deep component is an accessory component which you're seeing there. Uh, nothing much about it. So in this particular image, we can see the alar ligaments. I hope you understand that this is not the apical ligament, but part of the cruciate ligament. The apical ligament will be much anterior to this one. And it attaches the tip of the dense to the occipital bone. 
the other ligament we can add onto this list is the new ligament, ligamentum nuclei, which is basically the supraspinous ligaments of the label of the neck. Now, this image is trying to bring all the ligaments into perspective, and perhaps the one I'm emphasizing more on is the transverse component of the cruciform ligament, as you can see there, from the atlas going behind the dense to the atlas with the synovial articulation between them. So that the dense has an anterior synovial articulation with the anterior arc of atlas and the posterior synovial articulation with the transverse ligament of the atlas. Remember, this is the one that has a superior and an inferior longitudinal portion, which makes it then become cruciform ligament, as uh, we can see here. You can talk about them as being the superior band and the inferior band, or the ascending band and the inferior band of the cruciate ligament or cruciform ligament. Then the tip of the dens has the apical ligament of the dens attached to it. You can see that one there. That's the apical ligament of the dens attaching upward. The ala ligaments will attach on the lateral basis of the dens to the occipital bone. This one shows you the nuchal ligament. That's where we expect it to be. So those are craniovertebral junction uh, joints. We can now talk about the superficial structures in the neck, and we'll focus on uh, three components. The muscle, uh, nerves, and uh, veins. Let's start with the muscle. The muscle in the superficial structures of the neck is basically what you call platysma muscle. It's a broad sheet of muscle with varying prominence. Some people will have a very prominent uh, masseter, sorry, uh, platysma that you can actually see easily beneath the skin. And some people have a very thin one. You may not see it much. Important to note is that uh, platysma is a muscle of the second pharyngeal arc. And so it is innervated by the facial nerve and uh, the cervical branch of the facial nerve specifically is the one that supplies it. When masseter contracts, what will it do? Before we look at that, remember, maybe I'm just emphasizing that uh, the muscle is subcutaneous. So it is not beyond the deep fascia, but it's above the deep fascia of the neck. Because it's attached to the mandible to some extent, it may contribute to somewhat depressing the mandible. It may not be a very strong depression, but it does. Also because it attaches to the angle of the mouth and the lower lip, when it contracts, it will pull the lower lip down and the angle of the mouth down. And perhaps that's what we sometimes do as part of facial expression when we are surprised or maybe you've seen a horror thing. Perhaps that's how we respond sometimes. And this image shows you uh, the appearance of the mouth and neck when we contract uh, platysma. When the muscle contracts, you may see some oblique lines on the lateral skin of the neck there showing you contraction of platysma and sometimes you may also diminish the concavity between the lower border of the mandible and the neck there because of this contraction. Other than that, we are also going to talk about superficial veins of the neck. Important to note that these veins are largely tributaries of other veins. They drain the superficial structures but the amount of blood they drain is much less compared to the amount of blood that the deep veins drain. We'll talk mainly of two major veins in the superficial neck, the external jugular vein and the anterior jugular vein. External jugular vein to start with is formed by the union of the posterior division of retromandibular vein. Remember, retromandibular vein is a vein that runs somewhere there, divides into two anterior and posterior retromandibular divisions. The posterior division of retromandibular vein, which is the one I'm pointing, joins with the posterior auricular vein, which is that one, to form the external jugular vein. I hope you do remember that the anterior division of retromandibular joints with facial to form common facial vein. So as the external jugular vein descends, it crosses the sternocleidomastoid muscle and goes much lower down to terminate into the subclavian vein. A number of times it may be the only tributary to the subclavian vein, but uh, sometimes you may also have other veins terminating into the subclavian vein. 
just before it terminates, it will have to pierce now the deep fascia and make some sharp turn before it terminates into the vein, as you can see in this particular image. As the vein descends down, it receives some other superficial veins. The posterior external jugular vein is a small vein on the posterior aspect of the neck, so draining the superficial structures in the posterior neck. Transverse cervical vein is also a very tiny vein uh, that usually runs with the transverse cervical artery. It terminates into external jugular vein in a cross-sectional manner. Suprascapular vein, it's also the vein that usually runs with the suprascapular artery, and this one also terminates into the external jugular vein. Uh, those ones will tend to terminate just before the external jugular vein terminates into the subclavian. And that is what we are seeing somewhere there, that some veins terminate into the external jugular vein just before the external jugular vein terminates into the subclavian vein. Anterior jugular vein is this one, and we'll talk more about it shortly. Now, because of its location, the vein is superficial and is closely related to platysma muscle and also adherent to the soft tissues, the subcutaneous tissue in the neck. If there is laceration or trauma to the vein, external jugular vein, the lumen of the external jugular vein may tend to just remain patent. Because of that, it may easily suck in air, therefore causing air embolism. We fear development of air embolism following trauma to the external jugular vein. It's a prominent vein in the neck, actually. Occasionally, it's used for intravenous cannulation, especially when you are not able to see the other veins easily. You can easily do a cannula on the external jugular vein. The only disadvantage is that because the neck moves a lot, so this cannula will tend to be blocked easily. You can't really keep it there for long without it being blocked unless it's really wide. The anterior jugular veins are <coughs> paired veins as well on the anterior aspect of the neck. They form just uh, around the hide bone from a confluence of the submental veins. So the veins descend on either side of the midline in front of sanocleidomastoid muscle. And we can see them descending here. So this is the anterior jugular vein. That's the anterior jugular vein. As they go much inferiorly, the right and the left anterior jugular vein usually communicates through that U pattern. And that U pattern is what you call the jugular arc. This is usually just above the sternal notch. Anterior jugular veins communicate extensively with the external jugular vein in which case sometimes they terminate into the external jugular vein, but they may also terminate into the subclavian veins directly. So those are the superficial veins I wanted to talk about in this particular uh, session. We'll now talk about the sensory nerves in the neck. Remember, they're also cutaneous structures. The sensory nerves of the neck are derived from both the dorsal rami as well as the ventoremi of cervical spinal nerves. So concept here is that the cervical spinal nerves are the ones which contribute to the sensory innervation of the skin of the neck. However, these nerves could be from ventoremi or from dorsoremi. I hope you do remember the structure of a spinal nerve. And so when you talk about ventoremas and dorsoremas, you understand what that means. Let's talk about the branches from the ventoremi. The branch from the ventoremi of cervical nerves generally form the cervical plexus. So the nerve roots that contribute to the innervation of the skin from the ventoremi are C2 to C4. C1 does not quite give you, C1 ventoremi does not quite give you a cutaneous component that goes to the neck. Much of that may supply the meninges. Now, which skin do they supply? They supply the skin of the lower mandible of the anterior neck and the lateral neck largely. The skin of the posterior neck will be largely by the dorsal remi. So the ventral remi will supply these ones. We'll be talking more about the cervical plexus and I'll be saying that the cervical plexus 
consist of a plexus of the ventral rim or cervical nerves. And from these plexuses, we have some deep branches and superficial branches. The superficial branches are the ones we're talking about here. They contribute to the innervation of the skin. And so they'll eventually pierce the deep fascia to come out. There are some important superficial nerves which have been named. We have the lesser occipital nerve, as we can see that one, running on the posterior aspect of the stanocleidomastoid muscle superiorly. It arises from C2 and C3. The great auricular nerve crosses the stanocleidomastoid muscle in the upper part and goes towards the ear, supplying the ear from the lower end. It arises also from C2 and C3. We have the transverse cervical nerve, which is also called the anterior cutaneous nerve of the neck, which crosses stanocleidomastoid and supplies the skin of the anterior neck. You can call it transverse cervical nerve or the anterior cutaneous nerve of the neck, also from C2 and C3. Then we have the supraclavicular nerves. Supraclavicular nerves go to supply the skin on the lower part of the neck, as well as just below the clavicle. Supraclavicular nerves are from C3 and C4. They are in different groups. You can have the medial group, the intermediate group, and the lateral group of supraclavicular nerves. As you can see, the nerves appear to come from a common position there. We'll be talking more about that when you look at cervical plexus in great detail. The branches from the dorsoremi of uh, the cervical spinal nerves supply the skin of the back of the neck and also of the scalp. These nerves generalize from C2 to C7, sorry, C6. Uh, the C6 contribution is relatively inconsistent. So most of the time to be C2 to C5 dorsoremi. The named dorsoremi is C2 nerve, which we call the greater occipital nerve. So this greater occipital nerve usually pierces the trapezius muscle and, and also piercing the deep fascia to supply the skin of the scalp, the posterior scalp largely. That is C2 now. The other ones, C3, C4, up to C6 will pierce trapezius and tend to be a bit segmental apart from C3 that may also just take that upward direction, also contributing to supplying the scalp. The C3 nerve is sometimes called the third occipital nerve, or you may call it the least occipital nerve. Call it third or least occipital nerve. Uh, C4, C5, and C6, they just call the dorsoremi of those particular segments. Right, so that is the sensory innervation of the skin of the neck, and that helps us to understand the superficial structures. Now, I want to talk about the deep structure before that, we can talk about this deep fascia of the neck. Conventionally, the deep fascia of the neck is described to have uh, four components. We have the investing layer of the fascia of the neck, which is the one shown in blue. It goes around the whole neck, as you can see. And uh, it's the one just immediately beneath the superficial fascia. Some regions tend to be thicker and some regions very thin and perhaps not even well defined. Important to note is that uh, the investing fascia encloses some muscles and two are shown here. It encloses stanocleidomastoid muscle. It also encloses trapezius muscle to some extent. That is the investing fascia. It's the outer large fascia. Then we have another one, which we call the pretracheal fascia. So the pretracheal fascia is this one here in front of the trachea, the fascia in front of the trachea. So the fascia in front of the trachea, pretracheal fascia, is the one that encloses and runs anterior to the trachea as well as to the thyroid gland. You'll call that pretracheal fascia. It is the one that tends to surround the thyroid gland. It will also surround the esophagus. It will also surround the trachea. Well, some part of it also enclose the, what we call the strap muscles or the infrahyde muscles, as you can see in that particular middle image. So the one in red is the one we are calling the pretracheal fascia. 
The third fascia is what we call the prevertebral fascia. The prevertebral fascia is the one that is in front of the vertebra, as the name suggests, in front of the vertebral column, as well as the vertebral musculature. And the one now in red, well, I'm not so sure whether that's red or another color, now that there's this other one here. But uh, I hope you understand what I call red in this third image. So that is the prevertebral fascia. We can call it paravertebral fascia when you are now behind here because generally it's no longer pre. Important to note that that one encloses several musculature of the vertebral column. And with this green one, the green one is what you call the carotid sheath. This carotid sheath is more of, if formed by the three fascia, there's a point where the three fascia actually join around the common carotid vasculature, internal jugular vein vasculature. And so we have uh, a fascia sheet around them, which we call the carotid sheet. We'll talk more about the carotid sheet when we discuss the anterior neck triangle. Anyway, so these are the different fascial uh, systems of the neck. With that, now I can take you through how we divide the neck into different triangles. For the sake of description, the anterior lateral neck, so this is applying to the anterior and lateral, the anterior lateral neck can be divided into anterior and posterior triangles based on the location of the muscle sternocleidomastoid. The region behind the muscle is the posterior triangle, and the region anterior to the muscle is the anterior triangle. This posterior neck triangle can be very big or very small, depending on how big the, the clavicular component or sternocleidomastoid is. So if it's very small, then the triangle is big, but if the clavicular component of the muscle is big, then the triangle is small. This triangle is divided into two, as you can see in this particular image, by this muscle here, which we call the omohyoid muscle. The omohyoid muscle having two components, the inferior belly of omohyde and the superior belly of omohyde. This inferior belly of omohyde is the one that splits the posterior neck triangle into two. The upper part is called the occipital triangle, it's the larger one, and the lower part is called the supraclavicular triangle or the subclavian triangle. And those two triangles are the major focus of this particular class, as I mentioned earlier. But let's say something about the anterior neck triangles as well. The anterior neck triangles are further divided by two structures, the posterior belly, sorry, superior belly of omohyoid muscle, as well as the digastric muscle. Digastric muscle is called so because it has two bells, anterior and posterior belly. So when you look at the digastric muscle and superior belly of omohyoid, you have that uh, division there, dividing the anterior triangle into four major components. We have this one called the muscular triangle. We have this part called the carotid triangle. We have this part called the digastric triangle or the submandibular triangle. And we have this one called the submental triangle. So four triangles of the anterior neck triangle. We'll talk more about them in the subsequent lectures on neck triangles. Before we can focus on the boundaries and contents of the posterior neck triangles, perhaps it's important to just talk more about those muscles that have made the boundaries of the posterior neck triangles. We'll start with the muscle trapezius. The muscle trapezius is a flat muscle generally. Actually, a single muscle will be triangular, and this is the triangle. So we have that part, we have that part, and that part, three sided. It's triangular. The reason why it's called trapezius is because when you have the right and the left one, then it will appear like a diamond. The superior apex of the diamond is that region, and the inferior part is there, then the lateral apex of the diamond, that region, and that region. This is what will make it appear like a trapezium. And that's why it's called trapezius. But uh, if you look at a single one, it's actually triangular. Very flat muscle, considered an extrinsic muscle of the back. It is not intrinsic because these are immigrant muscles. 
the primarily muscles of the upper limb, which now attach the back. In particular, it will attach the vertebral column, it will attach uh, the occipital region. The muscle is kept to have three major parts. We have the superior fibers, which tend to descend from their origin to the insertion. The intermediate fibers, which run horizontally, and inferior fibers, which tend to ascend from their origin towards their insertion. So what's the origin? The origin will be the superior nucleoline, which is somewhere there. The external occipital protuberance, which is somewhere there, and uh, the nuchal ligament, which will be somewhere here. So that will tend to form the origin of the superior fibers of uh, trapezius muscle, those three. Then around this region will be the origin of the intermediate fibers of trapezius muscle. And then uh, below here will be the origin of the inferior fibers of trapezius muscle. This will include the tips of uh, spinous processes and the intervening supraspinous ligaments all the way to T2 spinous process, sorry, T12 spinous process. This image also captures that very well. So superior nuchal line, external occipital protuberance, then ligamentum nuchae coming all the way to C6 spine, then from the C, sorry, C7 spine, then from C7 spine, we have the spinous processes all the way to the T12 spinous process and the intervening supraspinous ligaments. Very extensive origin. The insertion will be also on the lateral third, sometimes up to half of the clavicle, and this will be largely the superior fibers. So the superior fibers insert onto the lateral third of the clavicle. Then the intermediate fibers insert onto the acromion process of the scapula, and uh, the inferior fibers insert onto the spine of the scapula, especially from below and the medial aspect of the spinous process of that. That attachment is important for us to understand its action, but we come to that. So in terms of its innervation, the motor innervation of uh, trapezius is from the spinal accessory nerve. Uh, the ventral rami of cervical spinal nerve C3 and C4 also supply the trapezius muscle, but this innervation is predominantly sensory. It is predominantly proprioceptive, as opposed to the innervation by the spinal accessory, which is largely motor. Well, there could be some queries about that concept, but conventionally believe that uh, Spinal accessory contributes motor innervation and uh, the cervical uh, ventral rami contribute proprioceptive innervation. There have been cases where following in a, a denervation through spinal accessory that uh, trapezius muscle is still functioning. And so bringing up to the concept that uh, some cervical ventral rami could actually be contributing motor innervation as opposed to just being purely sensory. This shows you the ac spinal accessory nerve. Remember the spinal accessory nerve is an important nerve uh, in the neck region. It has two components, but we'll talk more about it when we look at posterior neck triangle in great detail. Actions of trapezius generally is to stabilize the scapula by causing some movements. Superior fibers of trapezius tend to elevate the scapula. The intermediate fibers of trapezius retract the scapula and the inferior fibers of trapezius depress the scapula. It depends on which movement you're doing of the upper limb that will require either elevation, retraction or depression of the scapula but that stabilizes the scapula in a way. How about if the superior and the inferior fibers of the scapula, sorry, of the trapezius muscle contract at the same time? And especially if also the serratus anterior muscle also contract, those three forces will cause the scapula to cause a lateral rotation where the inferior angle labeled B, point of attachment of serratus anterior, and then uh, 
C, point of attachment, the inferior fibers of trapezius, and A, showing us the direction of pull of uh, the superior fibers of trapezius. Remember, superior fibers of trapezius attach onto the clavicle. But through those three forces, we can see that the scapula rotates laterally. So trapezius causes scapular lateral rotation. Remember, this is the role of superior and inferior fibers, not the intermediate fibers. We can test the integrity of uh, trapezius muscle by just trying to shrug your shoulders against resistance. And that's what we sometimes do to test trapezius muscle. The next muscle to talk about is the sternocleidomastoid mastoid muscle. The sternocleidomastoid mastoid muscle lies obliquely across the side of the neck and forming a very prominent uh, surface landmark even on a very obese person, a very thin person. You'll almost always see sternocleidomastoid. It originates by two heads, and that's why the name sternocleido. Uh, the sternal head comes from the manubrium of the sternum, and the cleido end comes from the medial aspect of the clavicle. The muscle is originating from below and inserts onto the mastered process as well as superior nucleoline, and that's why the name sternocleido mastoid, this is the muscle. It is innervated also by the spinal accessory now, providing motor innervation and uh, the ventral MIO C2, C3, providing proprioceptive innervation to the muscle. In terms of its actions, if one contracts, you will perhaps rotate the head to the opposite side. If both contract, then you'll flex the head. There's some important relations of the sternocleidomastoid muscle that it is good to take note of, and especially <clears throat> if you are in the laboratory, it will be important that you focus on these relations, so that those relations which are superficial and that those relations which are deep. And perhaps when we are taking your practical in the lab, just take keen interest on knowing the relations of uh, sternocleidomastoid muscle, especially superficial and deep one. On this particular superficial aspect, we can see uh, we have some cutaneous nerves, transverse cutaneous nerve, the neck, the external jugular vein, we expect the great auricular nerve. So there are a number of superficial structures that we expect to be crossing sternocleidomastoid. Platysma muscle was also superficial, remember. And then the deep structures are also quite many. Uh, this one still superficial, you can see the inferior part of the parotid gland there. Remember that uh, sternocleidomastoid muscle forms part of the parotid bed. And so it is not surprising, therefore, that uh, parotid gland is superficial to the muscle. This shows you the superficial structures that I have already mentioned. And this field shows you the deep structures that I've not yet mentioned. I want it that uh, you do this on your own as you look at the structures when you're in the laboratory. So you just list down the deep relations of sternocleidomastoid. But the field is there, you can see as much as uh, your eyes can appreciate. The third muscle to talk about is omohyoid muscle, which also forms a boundary in the posterior triangle. Omohyoid muscle consists of two bellies, the superior and uh, the inferior belly. This superior belly and the inferior belly are joined by somewhat a tendinous intermediate region that has extensions of the deep fascia clinging to it and so holding it somewhat below, sometimes known as the omohyde sling. The origin of omohyde is the upper border of the scapula, almost near the, st the scapular notch, and the insertion is the lower body of the hide bone. So it originates from below, going again up there. It's one of the infrahyde muscles helping in basically depressing the hide bone. The innervation of omohyde um, is the anser cervicalis. This is part of the deep branches of the cervical plexus, which have motor innervation to the musculature in the neck. I've already talked about the action of omohyde. Um, so remember that the inferior belly is the one that contributes to forming the posterior, uh, the boundary of the two triangles in the posterior neck triangle. So with that, I want us now focus on the occipital triangle itself. 
the occipital triangle is the upper part of the posterior neck triangle and is the larger triangle. Its borders are this one, the inferior belly of homohyde, then this one, anterior border of the trapezius muscle, and that one, the posterior border of sternocleidomastoid muscle. So this is the occipital triangle. The flow of the triangle is formed by a number of muscles. If we were to start from superiorly going down, we have the splenius capitis somewhere there. We have the laveta scapula somewhere there, and we have the scalene muscles. Generally, the scalene media should be the one prominent here. Scalene posterior may form it, but sometimes it's hidden. Scalenes anterior may also form it, but sometimes it's hidden. But uh, scalenes media is the constant variable here. What are the contents of the occipital triangle? This image shows us some of the contents of the occipital triangle. We have the spinal accessory now, which supplies both sternocleidomastoid and uh, trapezius muscle. But the seg segment we are seeing here the segment that has already passed beyond sternocleidomastoid, so the one going to supply the trapezius muscle. We have branches of the cervical plexus. The branches of cervical plexus we see in the neck here are the superficial branches, the ones that are cutaneous, largely. Then we have the transverse cervical vessels. The transverse cervical vessels, I'll talk about them shortly and we have level five cervical lymph nodes. Let me just say something about the cervical lymph nodes, but we'll talk more about the cervical lymph nodes when we discuss the anterior neck triangle. So cervical lymph nodes, the deep cervical lymph nodes are in groups. We have levels of deep cervical lymph nodes. The ones we call level five are the ones present in the posterior neck triangles. We'll talk more about them when we discuss the anterior neck triangle so that we understand the level anatomy of these cervical lymph nodes in a better way. I want us to put more attention to some two important structures in the neck, and that is the spinal accessory now, and uh, I'll tell you the vessels. Now, spinal accessory now originates from the ventral horn of the cervical segments C1, usually up to C5, sometimes up to C6. The constant ones are uh, C1 to C5 but you may also have a C6 contribution. So it's basically a spinal nerve. This spinal nerve roots join, and as they join, they form the spinal accessory nerve. This spinal accessory nerve travel upwards to pass through the foramen magnum. The intention is basically to join with the cranial root of the accessory nerve, and the two now constitute the accessory nerve. This union is almost uh, at the level of the foramen, uh, foramen, jugular foramen, when the accessory nerve is now about to come out. But now as the accessory nerve comes out through the jugular foramen, something interesting happens that the fibers from the cranial root leave the accessory nerve and join vagus nerve. And perhaps that's why accessory nerve is called so. It accesses the territory of Vegas. Anyway, the fibers from the spinal root are seem to be left alone. And so when the nerve exits through jugular foramen, the spinal accessory root fibers are on their own. This image shows you that as well. So we see the spinal roots and we see the cranial roots there, they join to form the accessory nerve. Then, after or within the jugular foramen, the cranial fibers join vagus, and so the spinal fiber come out on its own. So this spinal accessory nerve usually enters the deep substance, while it will pass through an, between a number of things, they are deep, uh, but eventually enters the deep substance of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, especially on its upper part, in which case it will innervate it, but some fibers also, also go beyond that one. The fibers that go beyond are the ones now being seen in the posterior neck triangle. 
And that's why we are saying that span accessories are content of the posterior neck triangle. These fibers which cross the posterior triangle of the neck and especially the occipital triangle will lie on the laveta scapulae muscle to reach the trapezius muscle. This image shows you the span accessory, that one, as it crosses from the posterior border of semiclidomastoid to the anterior border of the trapezius muscle. The landmark of its course is like this. So when you look at semiclidomastoid, it exits from the posterior border of semiclidomastoid at the junction between the upper one third and the lower two thirds of semiclidomastoid. Then it crosses obliquely on laveta scapulae muscle to reach the anterior border of trapezius muscle at the junction between the upper two thirds and the lower one third, generally speaking. What are the effects of injury to spinal accessory nerve? Having an assu that supplies both trapezius as well as uh, sternocleidomastoid. Of course, if you injure spinal accessory nerve within the posterior triangle, you will largely affect trapezius and not sternocleidomastoid. So that will cause paralysis of uh, trapezius. This can happen when some lymph nodes are being removed from the neck during surgery. It may injure or it could just be trauma. If you have supranuclear lesions of uh, sternocleidomastoid, we see some interesting manifestation. The effects on sternocleidomastoid tend to be ipsilateral, but the effects on trapezius tend to be by uh, contralateral. And we ask ourselves why. Now, the explanation to that concept is that the fibers, the supranuclear fibers, which are designated to supply sternocleidomastoid, decassate twice, double decassation. And that is why, therefore, the supranuclear lesions affect sternocleidomastoid on an ipsilateral basis, but they affect trapezius on a contralateral basis. Right, the next thing to talk about as a content of the occipital triangle is the cervical plexus. Let's talk about the formation of cervical plexus. Cervical plexus is formed by the ventral rima of C1 to C4 cervical nerve. So the C1 nerve, C2, C3, and C4 nerve uniting to form the plexus. Generally, C2, C3, and C4 have an ascending and a descending part. And so this ascending and the descending part of C2, C3, and C4, the ones that unite to form the plexus in form of a communication. This image shows you the union of those fibers, C2, C3, and C4, with the ascending and descending components giving rise to the plexus. And from the plexus, we have quite a number of nerves, as you can see from this particular image, and also from that particular image. Let's talk about these branches. From this plexus, we have some deep branches and superficial branches. Now C, the C1 has a fiber that goes up to join hypoglossal and then leaves hypoglossal to come down. Then C2 and C3 have these branches which unite again to unite with that one of uh, the C1, forming a loop. This is what we call the ansa cervicalis. This ansa cervicalis is one of the deep branches from the plexus and is largely for supplying the musculature in the neck. Other than from the ansa cervicalis, we have a number of muscles also being supplied from some deep branches. Remember the proprioceptive fibers which go to sternocleidomastoid, to trapezius. This is supply muscle that are deep branches, basically. We also have fibers which go to the laveta scapulae. It's also proprioceptive and they're deep branches. Also consider the one that goes, forms the phrenic nerve, especially from C3, C4, and C5, C4 being the major component. So that one also goes to the phrenic nerve. Remember, phrenic nerve 
supplies the thoracic diaphragm. That's also a deep branch. So those are deep branches from the cervical plexus. This image also shows you that anatomy. C1 fiber here, joining hypoglossal nerve and then leaving it as well to constitute the superior root of the ansa cervicalis. C2 and C3 uniting to form the inferior root of the ansa cervicalis. And from the ansa cervicalis, we have several muscles being innervated. There are some muscles which are innervated, not necessarily from the ansa, as we can see there, the nerve to thyroid is not necessarily from the main loop. Superficial branches of the cervical plexus are the ones which are predominantly sensory, so they go to the skin. Therefore, they need to pierce the deep part of the neck and supply the skin. We had already talked about these ones as part of the sensory innovation of the neck. We just, can just give their names. So we have the greater auricular nerve. We have the lesser occipital nerve. We have the transverse cervical nerve of the neck or the anterior cutaneous nerve of the neck. We have the less occipital and we have the supraclavicular nerves. This shows you the less occipital nerve. This is the greater auricular nerve. This is the anterior cutaneous nerve of the neck. And these are the supraclavicular nerves. This image shows you still these cutaneous nerves after they have already pierced uh, the skin and we see their distribution there. Let's say something clinical related to the cervical plexus, especially these cutaneous branches. So usually because the cervical nerves arise from a particular common point, they could be targeted um, by anesthetic drugs uh, to block them if you want to do an operation in the neck. Uh, the target is to go into a location where the nerves appear to emerge as a common stem, not necessarily so, but they are grouped together around there. So usually the landmark of that would be perhaps midpoint between the lower part of the mastered process and uh, the tubercle of C6. You draw an imaginary line like that, and at the midpoint of that one will correspond to the point at which these cutaneous nerves usually emerge behind sanocleidomastoid muscle. You can see the impression of sanocleidomastoid muscle there. So this is the point, uh, commonly in term the nerve point, and we can see that is the region. Basically, the nerves appear to arise there as a common in a group. Right. Other than the spinal accessory nerve and the cervical plexus, we had mentioned that we also have some blood vessels within the occipital triangle, and the blood vessel we talked about is the transverse cervical artery or the transverse cervical vessels. This is a transverse cervical artery, which is a branch of the thyrocervical trunk, which is a branch of subclavian artery. I'll prefer to talk about the artery when we discuss subclavian artery in the next um, uh, triangle we are going to talk about uh, just in a short while. Okay, now we can talk about that very triangle, the supraclavicular triangle, also known as the subclavian triangle. The supraclavicular triangle is the lower and smaller division of the posterior neck triangle. Uh, the location of the triangle is usually marked by a depression, which we call the subclavian, the, the supraclavicular fossa. This particular triangle is also known as the subclavian triangle. So this is the supraclavicular fossa. In this particular patient, this other side had something causing a swelling on it, and so you don't see it nicely, but on this other side is an, uh, the supraclavicular fossa marking the location of the supraclavicular triangle, also known as subclavian triangle. So what are the borders of this triangle? We can talk about sternocleidomastoid, posterior margin. We can also talk about the middle part of the clavicle, 
in the understanding that the anterior one third is the origin of sanopidomastoid and uh, the lateral the lateral aspect there will be also attachment of the clavicle and so this middle third here is the boundary of the triangle we also have the inferior belly of omohyoid muscle there and posterior margin of sanicleomastoid. So that is the border of the triangle. The flow of this triangle will be represented by the first rib. That's where we expect the first rib to be. And also the scalene medius muscle. And uh, perhaps the first slip of the serratus anterior muscle also within this particular region. What are the contents of the subclavian triangle? We have the third part of the subclavian artery. We may also have the subclavian vein there, but more consistently is the third part of the subclavian artery. We do have the trunk, and especially the lower trunks of the brachial plexus, and uh, to some extent, the upper roots of the brachial plexus also found within this particular triangle. We have the supraclavicular, sorry, suprascapular and transverse cervical blood vessels there. We have the termination of the external jugular vein. We can see that external jugular vein coming down and terminating into the subclavian vein. We already talked about external jugular vein. We have nervous in, nerve to subclavius, which is a branch of the brachial plexus. And uh, we also have level four cervical lymph nodes. So I'll talk more on the subclavian vessels and uh, perhaps the brachial plexus. Let's start with the subclavian artery. We have two subclavian arteries, the right and the left one. The right subclavian artery is a branch of the brachiocephalic trunk. So this is the sub right subclavian artery. It's a branch of the brachiocephalic trunk, which is this one labeled A. And brachiocephalic trunk is the first branch of the aortic arch. On the other hand, the left subclavian artery is usually a direct branch of the aortic arc and consider the third branch of the aortic arc. So this is the left and that's the right subclavian artery. The understanding is that they have different origin, but the rest of the story will discuss them as the same. This is the brachiocephalic trunk and that is the right subclavian artery. This is the right common carotid artery. Is the left common carotid artery and this is the left subclavian artery from the aortic arch. Each of the subclavian arteries described to have three parts with respect to their relationship with the scalenous anterior muscle. So this is the scalenous anterior muscle, which divides the artery into three parts, the first, second, and the third part. The first part is medial to the scalenous anterior muscle. The second part is behind the scalenous anterior muscle. And the third part is lateral to the scalenous anterior muscle. It is this third part of the subclavian artery that is actually a content of the supraclavicular neck triangle. But we will discuss subclavian artery in great detail here so that you don't have to repeat much of them in the subsequent uh, uh, triangles of the neck. This image shows you the, the right subclavian artery, the first part there medial to scalenous anterior muscle, second part behind scalenous anterior muscle, and third part lateral to the muscle. It also shows you the subclavian vein, which passes anterior to the scalenous anterior muscle. So scalenous anterior muscle separates the subclavian vessels. These vessels usually make a groove on the first rib and actually, in terms of their extent, the subclavian arteries extend up to the lateral border of the first rib where they continue with us, the axillary vessels. So beyond the first rib, we talk about axillary vessels that uh, medial to the lateral border of the first rib, we talk about subclavian vessels. There's no branching, just a continuation. What are the branches of the subclavian artery? The first part of the subclavian artery gives us three relatively constant branches. These branches are given in this particular region here. This is what we call the vertebral triangle, basically. Vertebral triangle being formed by 
we have laterally the anterior scalene muscle, medially the longer scoli muscle, and inferiorly the first part of subclavian artery. So these branches are given around the vertebral triangle, medial to the scalene's anterior muscle. The first branch is this one, the vertebral artery. The second branch is this one, the internal thoracic artery. And the third branch is this one, thoracervical trunk. I hope you then understand that uh, with the boundaries I've given you of the vertebral triangle, you don't expect internal mammary to be a content of the vertebral triangle, but the other two are definitely content of the vertebral triangle. The vertebral artery goes to the brain. The internal mammary artery, also called internal thoracic arteries, supplies the anterior chest wall, but also gives branches which also perforate and contribute to blood supply to the breast. This internal thoracic artery will also supply the diaphragm and uh, it may continue all the way up to the supplying the anterior abdominal wall as part of superior epigastric artery. Thyrocervical trunk has multiple branches and we're going to show you those ones shortly. But let's talk about the vertebral artery. It is the first branch of the first part of subclavian artery. The vertebral artery most of the time will enter through the transverse foramen of C6 most of the time, and then pass through the transverse foramen of the cervical vertebrae, then leave the transverse foramen of C1 and enters what we call the suboxital triangle, then through foramen magnum into the brain. We can divide the vertebral arteries having four segments. We have the cervical segment, which is leaving the subclavian artery to enter into the foramen transversarium. Then the vertebral segment, which is now passing through the foramen transversarium. Then the suboccipital segment, this is the third part. And then the intracranial segment, which is the fourth part. That intracranial segment is the one that will join the counterparts to form the basilar artery. So the right and the left vertebral artery is joined to form the basilar artery at the base of the brain to supply the brain. The other branches of the first part, thyrocervical trunk, to be more specific, gives us the suprascapular artery, the transverse cervical artery, and the inferior thyroid artery. This inferior thyroid artery may have a number of branches as well, including the ascending cervical artery, as you can see there. So this transverse cervical artery is the one that uh, passed through even the occipital triangle that uh, was also a content deposit of the occipital triangle. They supply a number of things in the neck. Second part of the subclavian artery is found within the interscaline triangle or known as the interscaline gap. The interscaline triangle is the gap between the anterior scalene and the middle scalene muscle. This interval, it's a muscular interval, contain the roots of the brachial plexus and the subclavian artery. So the branch of the subclavian artery within this interscaline triangle is usually the costal cervical trunk. The costal cervical trunk of uh, the subclavian artery gives rise to the deep cervical artery, which supplies the deep structure in the neck, and supreme intercostal artery, which supplies the upper part of the intercostal uh, spaces, especially posteriorly. The third part of the subclavian artery is now the one that is found within the supraclavicular triangle, and that's why we are talking about subclavian artery. It is the one found within the subclavian triangle itself, lateral to the scalene's anterior muscle. This gives rise to the dorsal scapular artery, although it is a variant artery. Sometimes it may not come from there, but yes, dorsal scapular artery is a variant branch of the third part of the subclavian artery. It supplies the structures in the dorsal scapula, as the name suggests. This image will show you the first part of subclavian artery, second part behind that muscle, and the third part there. It shows you the branch from the first part, 
So this is the vertebral artery, first branch. This is the internal thoracic, second branch. And this is the thyrostomical trunk, which gives rise to the suprascapular artery, that one. The transverse cervical, that one. And the inferior thyroid, this one. This inferior thyroid also giving the ascending cervical, that one. The third part is showing us here, giving rise to the dorsoscapular artery, which is that one. So this is the right one, remember, this is the right common carotid, so this is the brachycephalic trunk. On the left side here, we are seeing a variant origin of the vertebral artery. The vertebral artery, in this case, the left vertebral artery is arising direct from the aortic arc instead of arising from the left subclavian artery. This is a known variation generally, but this is the left subclavian artery. This is the right subclavian artery. In this case, the right subclavian artery is giving rise to the right vertebral artery in its normal course. Um, let's talk about something clinical about the subclavian artery. So the branches from the first part of subclavian artery, especially the one related to the thyrocervical trunk. So this is the suprascapular artery and the transverse cervical artery. Those branches, usually anastomose around the scapula, with branches from the third part of axillary artery. The branches from the third part of the axillary artery that contribute to this anastomosis are mainly what you call the subscapular artery, which gives rise to what you call the thoracodosal artery and the scapular circumflex artery. So, in case there is some obstruction between after the subclavian artery has given rise to the thyrocervical trunk and before the axillary artery giving rise to the subscapular artery, <clears throat> if there's some obstruction along this segment, then it means that we can have an alternative route of blood flow to the upper limb. And that alternative route of blood flow to the upper limb will have to open up the scapular anastomosis, especially if this obstruction is slow progressive, then it gives the anastomosis time to open up to provide a collateral route of blood supply to the upper limb. In that case, the blood vessels around the scapula will be dilated quite significantly, and perhaps the scapula will also be seen to be moving with the pulsations of the artery in a condition we call pulsatile scapula. So when you see pulsatil scapula, it means that uh, we have opening up of the scapular anastomosis with a collateral blood flow from the first part of subclavian artery to the third part of the axillary artery because there is some obstruction between the two segments. The other thing I want to talk about clinical is related to uh, the fact that the right and the left vertebral arteries join to form the basilar artery at the base of the brain. There's something called the subclavian steel syndrome. Subclavian steel syndrome occurs as a result of, again, obstruction of the subclavian artery, the first part of subclavian artery before it gives rise to the vertebral artery. So let's say the left vertebral subclavian artery is obstructed at that point. How will the upper limb, the left upper limb, receive blood flow? The left upper limb may still receive blood flow through the vertebral artery because this is the situation. Blood will flow to the brachiocephalic trunk, then to the right subclavian artery, and that means that blood will flow to the right vertebral artery, but the right and the left vertebral artery meet at the basilar artery. So because there's no blood coming this way, blood can flow from the right vertebral to the left vertebral here, and then to the left upper limb. But at what expense? The blood that was supposed to go to the brain is now being redirected to the contralateral upper limb. And that's why we're saying that now subclavian artery is stealing blood from the brain. And we call it the subclavian steel syndrome. It occurs as a result of obstruction or stenosis of subclavian artery before it gives rise to the vertebral artery. 
All right, so we can now talk about the subclavian veins. Subclavian veins are continuation of the axillary veins beyond the lateral board of the first rib. So we have a right and a left subclavian vein. They'll extend therefore from the lateral board of the first rib to the medial border of the anterior scalene muscle where they unite with the internal jugular veins to form the brachiocephalic veins. We can see this is the right subclavian vein. This is the right internal jugular joining to form the right brachiocephalic vein. Similarly, left internal jugular, left subclavian, left brachiocephalic vein. The right and left brachiocephalic veins are the ones that unite to form the superior vena cava. The subclavian veins receive constantly the external jugular vein and uh, variably the dorsal scapular vein and the anterior jugular veins. Those are the tributaries of the subclavian veins. Something important to note is that at the junction between the left, sub, left subclavian vein and the left internal jugular vein, at that junction, usually we have the thoracic duct terminating at that point. Thoracic duct, this structure marked yellow in this particular case, it is the main lymphatic trunk of the body coming out there from the lower abdomen, from the abdomen, piercing through the diaphragm, ascending all the way to the left at the junction between the left subclavian and left internal jugular vein. So this is a point of entry of lymph back into the bloodstream. It receives, that junction receives the thoracic duct. A similar thing happens on the right, except that we now do not call it the thoracic duct. We call it the right lymphatic duct. The right lymphatic duct now enters the junction between the right subclavian and right internal jugular vein. The right lymphatic duct generally drains the right upper half of the body. And the thoracic duct drains the rest of the body generally. The junction between upper and lower in this case is the level of the diaphragm. So the right side above the diaphragm drains via the right lymphatic duct. Everything else drains via the left, or rather drains by the thoracic duct. Um, from a clinical point of view, subclavian vein is a common site of intravenous cannulation. Uh, we use subclavian vein a lot to give what we call to do what we call central line. When for a number of indications, usually ultrasound guided procedure and the vein is usually just behind the clavicle. That's why it's called subclavian. The other content of the supraclavicular neck triangle is the brachial plexus. Uh, the discussion of the brachial plexus has been, I believe, well done when you learned the limb anatomy. And so you know how the plexus is formed. We have C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1 roots, which join to form upper, middle, and lower trunk. And that the trunks divide into anterior and posterior divisions. The divisions unite in such a way that the anterior division of the upper trunk and middle trunk form the lateral cord. The anterior division, the lower trunk, continues the medial cord. And the posterior divisions unite to form the posterior cord. Now let's put something into perspective. The roots are generally, the first segments are a bit high, and then the trunks. The trunks, and especially the lower two trunks, are largely within the subclavian triangle. The upper roots, that is C5 and C6 roots, so largely within the subclavian triangle, and perhaps are the upper trunk there is usually hidden by omohyoid muscle. The divisions here of the brachial plexus are retroclavicular, so they're behind the clavicle. And then the cords of the brachial plexus are within the axilla. So when you talk about the supraclavicular triangle contain the brachial plexus, it's largely the upper two roots and the lower two trunks. Those are the various parts which are within the subclavian triangle. Uh, the interscaline triangle is this gap between the anterior scalene and the middle scalene, and that is the region that also contains the lower roots, especially, and the subclavian artery itself there. Remember, the vein is in front, 
but the artery is behind the muscle. This one also shows you the phrenic nerve as it comes out. Partly a branch of the cervical plexus and partly a branch of the roots of the brachial plexus as well. The discussion regarding the brachial plexus is under limb anatomy, and I think uh, you can refer to that if you've forgotten much about that. But remember, the brachial plexus are contents of the supraclavicular neck triangle at some point. We can now finish with the information regarding the suboccipital triangle. Not that it's part of the posterior neck triangles, but it's an important triangle that to talk about even as we talk about this posterior region. So the suboxial triangle of the neck is a deep triangular space in the posterior aspect of the neck, usually between the squamous part of the occipital bone, especially the lower part, and the atlas and the axis, and especially posteriorly. So this is occipital bone, this is the atlas, and this is the axis, that posterior region. The walls of this triangle are three because they're triangle. So superolaterally, we have this one, obliquus capitis superior. Superomedially, we have this one, rectus capitis posterior major. And inferiorly, and especially inferolaterally, which is almost the base, we have this one which is obliquus capitis inferior. So this is the triangle. This, just in terms of landmarks, so this is the transverse process of C1, the atlas. This is the spinous process of the posterior tubercle of C1, the atlas. And this is the spinous process of C2, the axis. The flow of the triangle is by the posterior atlanto occipital membrane. Remember the membrane that reinforces the atlanto occipital joint, as well as the posterior arc of the atlas. So these are the ones which are posterior and therefore on the flow of the triangle. The roof of the triangle is covered by semispinalis capitis muscle, which is this one cut. So you have to first remove trapezius muscle. Deep to trapezius, remove semispinalis capitis muscle. After that, then you find this triangle. So it's a quite deep triangle. This image shows you trapezius still intact. And semispinalis then also must be removed after that for you to be able to see the triangle. What are the contents of the triangle? We have the suboccipital nerve. The suboccipital nerve is the C1 dorsoremus nerve. Then we have the third part of the vertebral artery. Remember, I told you that the third part is the part in the suboccipital triangle. And uh, we also have the suboccipital venous plexus. The suboccipital venous plexus here communicate with the deep veins around here and also communicating the sigmoid sinus as well. So what's the clinical importance of uh, the suboccipital triangle even as we finish? Um, so for the veins, the venous plexus are, could be a point of spread of infections, uh, but uh, historically not, maybe not currently done, but historically this used to be a point of access of the vertebral artery when you want to do some imaging on the vertebral artery, this is a point of access. No longer done because there are better ways of now doing that. Great. So that's the story about uh, the and triangles of the neck and especially focusing on the posterior triangle of the neck, the two triangles, uh, occipital triangle and supraclavicular triangle. But we've also talked about the suboccipital triangle. In this lecture, again, we just gave the general discussion about the neck and especially the neck triangles. So our next session on neck triangles will be on the infrahyoid anterior neck triangles that will be focusing mainly on the carotid triangle and muscular triangle of the neck. Thank you very much.